Okay, thank you for coming. And you did not uh, miss the opportunity to be here today because we have a special event here and it's my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Professor Hartzibanger, uh, who is a distinguished professor of Department of Economics of University of Maryland. And to, uh, he's a scholar in the field of uh, statistics and firm uh, level dynamics, as far as I understand. Um, and interesting is that, that uh, measurement and statistical method that he had helped to develop are increasingly used by statistical agencies across the world, and I hope that the Georgia will be next case. And helpful for us, also for business schools, to incorporate these methods and knowledges into our curricula. And uh, now the floor is yours. Great, thanks very much. So it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, so, so thanks very much for, for coming. I'm a professor of economics at the, at the University of Maryland. Uh, I'll go ahead and say from the outset, uh, I, I'm obviously not an expert uh, on the Georgian economy. Um, I actually spend most of my time studying um, the US economy. But one of the things, as you'll see in, in just a few minutes, and I'll try, uh, try, try to make this both uh, reasonably uh, light and, uh, and not too long, one of the things that, that you'll see is um, I, I have looked at, at uh, labor markets um, and uh, economies from, from around the world. And I, I, you know, I actually have more questions for you about, about how Georgia is, is doing on, on these dimensions. But I think the, the kind of findings that I'll talk about, I think you'll find uh, uh, potentially interesting for, for, for what Georgia itself is, uh, is going through. So let me give you a... Um, an, an overview uh, of, of the talk. So, so in terms of uh, sort of you know basic uh, economics, um, probably one of the biggest questions that, e that economists, but can I say also policymakers, spend their time uh, worrying about, uh, both at the at the national level but at international level, organizations like the World Bank and the IMF and, and so on, is is um, we see large differences in GDP per capita across countries. Um, and, and, and there are quite persistent differences. And so that, that, you know, so, so if we ask ourselves a, a, a sort of one of the basic questions is, why is that the case? Why, why isn't it the case that we, we don't see convergence um, in GDP per capita um, across countries? Why some countries are, are more successful uh, than others in terms of at least uh, GDP? You can ask the same question about within a country. Sometimes a country seems to be experiencing higher growth rates um, uh, uh, than others. Now, uh, do, do we fully know the answer to that question? The answer is no, we don't. Um, we, um, you could say that's, that's the challenge of, uh, of policymakers. What, what exactly is the, is the right, can I say, economic policies, but also other policies for a, for a country in order to be successful? But, but we do know certain things. So we, so we do know that countries that have low GDP per capita have low Productivity, and so I want to make sure everybody understands when I use the term productivity, what I mean by that. Um, what we try to do, what statistical agencies do, and I'm, and I'm sure they do this in Georgia as well. But, but can I say, uh, you, know, you know, this is what the the World Bank and the IMF, but also uh, you know, every statistical agency, they try to measure the total GDP. I've already talked about that in, in the economy, and then they try to measure not just the population that gets you the GDP per capita, but they try to figure out well. How much uh, capital and labor is going into the production process? So let, let me just for right now call that combined capital and labor inputs, total inputs. So productivity is output per input. Sometimes we measure it output per worker, but, but oftentimes it's out, output per capital and labor. And so, so you can say, so well, you know, I'm not so surprised that uh, output is GDP per capita is closely tied to productivity, but I think, I think it's critical because it, it's partly telling you um, and not only partly telling you that, that if you're trying to understand GDP per, uh, per capita and productivity, um, uh, oftentimes you want to go say, well, why is it the case that in this country businesses are successful and in other countries they're not so successful? That's, that, it turns out, it, it is the critical question. And I'm going to talk a, a lot about the evidence of that. And, and, and so one of the things I've done is I've studied countries around the world um, is, is, is the following, uh, this isn't an explanation, but the following is a, a key characteristic of a successful economy. 
Is it the case that in your economy, and I don't know whether the, what the answer about this is in Georgia, but I suspect uh, it, 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 there, there could be improvement on, on this dimension. Is it the case in your economy that the largest businesses in the economy are the most productive businesses? And if that's not the case, then chances are your economy's not doing very well. In a, in a like fashion, uh, what, what you want it to be the case is, is are young businesses that are starting up that, that have the potential to be productive, are they growing? That turns out to be another key indicator. And you can say this is you know, so basic you're not surprised, but I want to go look. We're going to see countries differ dramatically on these dimensions. And then at the end of the day, we're going to ask ourselves again the question, why? And I'll talk a little bit about the why. And the why, you know, the, the why is much harder than the what, obviously. So we can, we can make progress on telling you indicators for successful an economy, exactly what the ingredients are to make an economy successful. Um, it, it, it is harder. Now, I'm also going to talk about labor, uh, labor market flexibility in this context, because one of the ways an economy um, exhibits, the, I'll say, the key characteristic, are the largest businesses the most productive businesses, or flip, the flip side, are the most productive businesses the largest businesses. One of the ways that happens is, for, is the labor market needs to be flexible, because what we discover, as we'll sort of see in just a, a, few, a few minutes, is is some businesses turn out, you could say some managers, but also some business, some business models turn out to not be such great business model. And, and those business models, those products, those processes, those businesses need to contract and other businesses need to be able to grow. And that can only happen if you have a flexible labor market. And so we'll talk quite a bit about that. Now that's easier said than done, right? Because, because flexibility in the labor market requires lots of things. And we'll talk about some of the challenges um, associated with that. So, so most of my talk's going to be, you know, very basic graphs. So, one of the things that we have found as we've looked around the world, this, by the way, this is a hypothetical distribution. This is not a, the actual distribution for any economy. Is that go inside any industry in any country, right? So, for example, go in the automobile assembly industry in the United States, okay? Or, you know, go into uh, the retail sector in Georgia. Okay, go into any sector you'd like. And go, you know, again, go to some very narrow definition. So not just the retail sector, if we're talking in Georgia, not that I've got the data for Georgia, but if I did, go to the restaurant industry in Georgia, okay? So the point is, go think about a narrow industry where the businesses are largely competing with each other. Here's what we found. We found large differences in productivity across businesses in the same sector. Very large differences. This is true um, in well-functioning economies, you could say. The U.S. has been largely well-functioning. In, in well-functioning economies, and, but also in less well-functioning economies. That, this, this, this is not what differs so much. But, but I do want to emphasize just how big the differences are. So, so let me use a statistic, which is, uh, we, we often use a statistic, something called the interquartile range. It's a very simple statistic. So we take businesses, we in, into percentiles, that is, we rank the businesses, and we take businesses at the 75th percentile, and we take businesses at the 25th percentile, and we find that, I'm, I'm, I'm using this in terms of log points, but that's roughly, can be thought about as percents, roughly 30% gap between the 75th and the 25th percentile business. What does that mean? That means if you could somehow move the resources away from the 25th percentile business, to the 75th percentile business, you could immediately raise productivity in that sector by 30%. That's a big number, because if, those of you who know the statistics on productivity, if you have a two or three percent increase in productivity in your economy, I'm not talking about GDP, but productivity, that's output per input, you're having a really good year, okay? So 30% is a huge number, so you should ask yourself the question, well, why aren't economies doing that? And the answer is, actually, successful economies are doing that all the time. But the way a successful economy often grows is it's moving businesses, it's moving resources away from this part of the distribution towards the upper. That's what's constantly going on in successful economies. Unsuccessful economies are ones in which there's too much action, too much activity at the low end of the productivity distribution. Or what's worse is that somehow the economy is distorted enough that the largest businesses are not out of not the most productive businesses, but they're the least productive businesses. That again is a sign the economy is distorted. And I'll talk, I'll talk about 
not Georgia because I'm no expert in Georgia, but a variety of economies where that's at least been true and where it's get, at least getting better. All right. So I just wanted to sort of say, by the way, that this, this is just a scatter plot, and, and, and I don't want to draw a, a deep inferences here, other than to say I've used data here for a large number of countries and industries. And all I wanted to say is in every country and every industry we've looked at, there's lots of dispersion in, 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 in productivity within the industries. So we have not yet found a country or an industry for which there isn't large dispersion. So I am confident if I had data for Georgia and I could go inside every industry in Georgia that I would see some businesses doing well and some businesses not doing well. All right. And then the real question is not just whether that's the case. That's that's sort of like a that's sort of basic economics. Is well, is it the case that the ones that are by doing well, I mean in terms of productivity, is it the case that the most productive businesses are the largest businesses, or is there some distortion in the Georgian economy so that there are large businesses that are large not because they're the most productive, but perhaps because they got favored treatment in some fashion? Okay, they got some competitive advantage. If that's the case, if that happens in lots of economies around the world, you're in trouble. Okay, and that turns out to be uh, a, a, a critical factor. So, so I'm going to use some kind of playful animation to talk a little bit about this. So one, feat, one way to think about economies is that it has two kinds of businesses. It has lots of different kinds of businesses. It has small businesses, which I'm going to call mice, and large businesses, which I'm going to call elephants. Okay. And so first I'm going to give you some evidence from the United States. So in the United States, most businesses are small. Okay. But, so notice how big the, how, how many mice there are. But while most businesses are small, most workers work for large businesses. So a, another basic fact, this is going to be true around the world, by the way, is Get that fact into our head. Most businesses are small, but most workers work for large businesses. And essentially, that's just a statistical statement that the size distribution of activity is skewed. Okay? Not so surprising, but it's, it turns out to be critical here in what I'm talking about. So if I, if I look around the world, now I've got not just the United States, but you can see I've got a variety of countries around the world, European economies, Latin American economies, the Eastern Europe and, 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 and Western Europe, and, and I've got a statistic here, and basically it's the ratio of the size of the business in the top quartile to the, to the, 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 to the bottom quartile. And you can see that ratio is large in every country. So that's not what, here's, here's, here's the thing, that's not what makes an economy successful or not, is having a skewed distribution. Every economy has a skewed distribution. So, I, so he, he, it's like we've got the following two ingredients. I've got a very basic story here today. In every economy we look at, we have lots of dispersion of productivity. Some businesses are good at doing what they're doing, some are not so good. In every economy, we have some small businesses and some large businesses. The real question is, are they connected? Okay? And some economies, the large businesses are the least productive businesses. If, that, if your economy is that sort, you are in trouble. That's the basic, that's one of the core messages of today, and then we want to talk about the role of labor market flexibility. So the way to see that is a simple statistic, and, and for those who got statistical background, I guess is whatever, this is, a, this is a covariance statistic. And so what's the covariance? It's a very simple covariance. It's essentially the co covariance or correlation between size and productivity within industries in the country. So this number is bigger if it's the case that the largest businesses are the most productive businesses. So you can see, in this particular set of countries, the United States has the largest covariance. So, a simple indicator, why does the U.S. have such high productivity, high such GDP per capita? Because the most productive businesses are the largest businesses in the United States. That's more true in the United States than it is in Western Europe, but the number's at least positive in Western Europe. Okay? You can see in, the, uh, in Hungary, Romania, Slovenia, the three countries for which I've got data right here. I'm going to show you some other countries in a, in a bit. Why am I showing you different countries in different settings? Because this is from a study where these numbers are, uh, I can compare the magnitudes. And so in different kind of studies, I've got quite somewhat different data, so I have to be careful about uh, comparisons. So I only try to make comparisons when I compare apples to apples. Okay? So 
So, uh, so, 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 um, so one is you, you do see large differences in this uh, across countries. Interestingly, this happens to be, by the way, data for the 1990s. All right. Now, interestingly, in the 1990s, even though the Eastern European economies had low averages, the change in their covariance was very impressive. So, so you could say, how is that possible? They had such low averages, and, and, they, and, and I'm not going to show you this. They had negative covariances in the early 1990s. Back in the early 1990s, in Hungary, Romania, and Slovenia, the largest businesses were the least productive businesses. So, so what, what went right in those economies in the 1990s? It started to turn positive. It didn't get very positive, right, because we saw in the previous slide, but at least it started to turn positive. And so we're going to see that over and over again as we look across the economy. So I'm going to quickly scroll through a couple of cases. Oh, no, but, the, but remember, this is the change. The U.S. already had a very positive covariance. So the U.S. Could essentially already had the, the most productive businesses were largest. So, so in some sense, you could say the, the, the way to interpret this is there was convergence, but not rapid convergence. Whoops. Oops, I went too far. Because, it, because on average, you could say that they haven't caught up. So the way to think about it again is, let's use Hungary for an ex as an example. All right? It had a negative covariance in the early 1990s, and it, went, and it went slightly positive by the end of the 1990s. So it was still far below the United States, but it made progress. That's kind of what you would hope, right? Economies that are going through market reforms, you would expect them to improve, and to improve their prove more rapidly, that's, that's what you would hope. And indeed, from at least this indicator, these three economies did well in that respect. Okay. So let me give you a couple of other examples. So Col Colombia uh, also had rapid mar market reforms in the 1990s. And I'm, again, uh, slightly different notation, but it's the same idea. So the cross term is the covariance term here. So notice the covariance term in, in, in Colombia turned positive over the course of the 1990s when it did lots of market reform. When it reformed capital markets, it reformed labor markets, it opened up to trade, uh, and the like. Here's China. So China, uh, again, an interesting, uh, obviously China did very well over this particular period of time, 1998 to 2005. Notice, and this, this will even help us on your question, notice that the covariance, so, and I, I think, again, I've been, Pardon me for the label, it's called the OP gap here. The OP gap is the covariance term here. And so the OP gap is measured on the right axis. Notice it was negative in 1998. So what, is, what does a negative covariance or correlation say? It says, it, in 1998, the largest businesses were the least productive businesses in China. And so notice that China, even by 2005, that covariance had barely gotten positive. But just going from negative to zero is a big improvement. Okay, because it, so, so you, you could say this is sort of two messages here. China has a long way to get, go to get to the covariance it has to the United States exhibit. It's a very long way to go. So it has a, a lot of, but also for those of you who are wondering, you know, can China sustain the growth it has in the last uh, decade? Well, actually this says, yeah, they have a lot of room to, to, to improve things. Okay, they're, they're far from the, uh, from, the, from the frontier in that respect. All right, so, so I think you've gotten that message, okay? So message one is uh, a key thing that varies across countries is are the largest businesses the most productive businesses, all right? Now, how do, you know, how do you get there? Okay, what do you need to do? Well, one thing you need to do is have a flexible labor market. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna talk about. So here I'm gonna talk and I'll watch my time. I'll talk uh, quite a bit about the United States for a few minutes, for about four or five slides, and then I'll talk, start talking about the rest of the world again. So I'll talk about uh, how you could say the U.S. historically has had amongst the most flexible labor markets uh, in, in the world. So, so I want to talk about some other statistics that, that are important as indicators of how flexible your labor market is, and also what the role of different kinds of businesses are for your flexibility. So, so the concept I want to talk about is a, a, a concept I've actually had a hand in developing, um, which is it, it, uh, called job creation and destruction. And it's a really very basic idea. So what, what's job creation? I, I look at an economy and I ask, I, I look at all the businesses that expanded between last year and the current year. 
and I add up all those jobs. All right? And I call that job creation. And then uh, for job destruction, I did the opposite. I take all the businesses that contracted, and I add up all the job losses. Right? And in doing so, it turns out to be critically important to not only count continuing businesses, but new businesses and exiting businesses. So the US, in this period of time, by the way, just to help you get your bearings if you're not used to these kind of statistics, so the US has typically <coughs> had a net growth rate of, and in terms of employment, just under 2%. Okay? But underlying that 2% net growth rate is an enormous pace of business expansion and enormous pace of business contraction at the, in, at the same time, and by the way, in the same industries. And let me re already, because I, I want to watch my time here, related to my earlier remarks, why is the US exhibiting all this enormous creation and destruction? Well, I'm going I'm to go through it probably too quickly. When things are working well in the United States, the businesses that are creating jobs, they're the most productive businesses. The businesses that are destroying jobs, these are the least productive businesses. So the US is constantly reinventing itself. All right? And part of the way it's reinventing itself is through new firms, business startups. I'm going to emphasize the role of business startups in just a second. So just to give you a sense of how important business startups are, now I've moved to, to uh, but, uh, but I wanted to be able to compare in levels. So between 2003 and 2007, the U.S. was in a business cycle expansion. So by the way, this, these numbers would not look so good since 2007, obviously. It's been a business cycle, you know, uh, I, it started to turn around, but the U.S. has had net business loss. So but I intentionally, I, so I'm not just trying to cherry pick here, I'm, I'm intentionally picking a time of expansion to when things are going well. So in a good year in the United States, in a good year, the U.S. created 2.5 million net new jobs. All right? And, and that seem, may seem like a big number uh, like, you know, in terms of the, the size of the Georgian economy. But you've got to remember, there's, there's over 120 million workers in the United States, so it's a big economy. So don't, don't, don't get overwhelmed by the, the number. It's really the comparison that I'm trying to make here. So almost 2.5 million net new jobs in the United States in the, in, in each year. Notice that business startups accounted for more than 3 million every year. So you might say, how can that even be? Business startups account, well, that's actually because um, th this is part of the, I'll call it the creative destruction process that's ongoing in the United States. We're constantly having some businesses contract and others expand, and a critical feature in this expansion is business startups. They play a critical role. So, what, so where am I heading with this message? Some of this labor market flexibility and some of this flexibility is a, it has to do with entrepreneurship. That is, businesses starting up and creating jobs. Is job creation from business startups important in the United States? Yeah, actually, it's enormously important. All right? So to, 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 to look at this job creation from young businesses, you need to realize that, that do all the businesses that start up uh, survive? Actually, no, most of them fail. So the United States of that three million net new jobs created every year, almost half of them are gone within five years. Okay, but so that's the red bars here, by the way. So if I add it up, I'm over 50 percent loss from from the businesses that just started up. And what what happened? You know, what what happens in the United States to most new businesses? They fail. But here's the big but: conditional on survival, the fastest growing businesses in the United States are the young businesses. That's the blue bars. So the U.S. is an economy where there's enormous amount of experimentation all the time and reinventing. So lots of destruction, lots of creation. Lots of that creation is coming from new businesses. Actually, lots of the destruction is coming from young businesses. But the ones, the young businesses that survive, they are, uh, they are amongst the biggest job creators in the United States. Now, not only are they the most, they create lots of jobs, let me skip this slide, let me go all the way to this slide, they're actually amongst the most productive businesses. And so this is a, if I compare, the, the, the lower bars are the businesses that are exiting, including the young businesses. The young businesses that are surviving are actually more productive than their larger, more mature incumbents. So, so what's going on in the United States? What's going on is the U.S. is constantly reinventing itself. Lots of, lots of business startups, lots of creation, lots of destruction. The businesses that survive, 
are the most productive businesses. The businesses that grow are the most productive businesses. How's that related to my first message? That's exactly how you get a positive covariance between size and productivity. That, that's sort of the challenge for a market economy. It's not as though you get there and you stay there. It's not as though you win the race, so to speak, and you're done. Part of the problem is the economy is constantly changing. So you find yourself, yes, some businesses were great in the 1960s. They don't have what it takes to survive in the, in the 21st century. All right? And so that, that's one of the difficulties of, 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 of market economy. So, so let, me, um, let, let, let me try to, uh, I'm going to do some playful animation here now to kind of talk about um, but the, the kind of model I have in mind. So for those of you who know economists, we like to write down mathematical models for, for the way, for better or worse, for the way the economy is. And so I promised I would not use any math. So instead of using math, I'm going to show you some pictures. Or this is like a, a picture uh, a version of the economy. So it's going to be a little silly, okay? And, and there's only two slides of this, but I think you'll get the point. So, so the, you could say the parable I'm trying to tell is one in which uh, innovation and productivity plays a critical role for growth. And so, so I want to think about business startups. So what's the kind of model I have in mind? And, and this will help us think about what's critical for, for whether an economy is going to do well. Is first, you need, you need entrepreneurs who have ideas. So the light bulb is ideas. Okay, so the economy is doing well, you've got entrepreneurs that, that have creative ideas. And, and suppose you have an idea for a business, what's one of the first things you need is you need financing. So one critical feature, if we go right down, and, and what we saw in the end it is you're, you're not going to start the business unless somebody's willing to fund it. Maybe you're going to fund it yourself, or you're going to get some angel financer, or if you have well-developed financial markets, you're going to have venture capital. Okay, that'll help you finance. So let's suppose you have a good idea, or you think you have a good idea, that's sort of a real quick question, and you get some financing somehow or another, and so the business is born. Okay? But the story I'm telling, or the story, the, the, the evidence I've shown you is that most businesses fail, but amongst, again, if things are going well, the businesses that survive should be the ones that grow. And so there's an, there is, in the, in the U.S. at least, this big upper out, uh, dynamic. Now, and by the way, I should, I, I, I already I mentioned this before, most businesses, most business startups are small. They, they start up as, as these mice. They don't start as elephants. They only become elephants if it turns out they're the most productive and the most profitable. So, some businesses discover they're good at what they're doing, and they grow, and they grow very rapidly. I'm going to use gazelles as my fast-growing businesses. Those are my, remember I had in the chart, those are my young businesses that are the most rapidly growing businesses in the United States. Okay. But many of those businesses discover they're not so good and they fail. All right. So the, what's the economic model? It's, an, it's a model of experimentation. It's a model of creative destruction. It's a model in which several elements are critical for economic growth. One is financial markets have to be sufficiently developed for this process to work. Labor markets have to be sufficiently flexible so the businesses that don't do well can actually contract and fail and, it, and it's not devastating for the economy. Uh, it's also going to be the case that the, the rapidly growing businesses, they don't face uh, poor institutions so that, so that it's too hard for them uh, to compete against perhaps uh, large mature incumbents who have unfair uh, advantages in terms of markets, but also that they have sufficiently flexible labor markets, they actually can grow and grow rapidly. So <coughs> this silly little picture is hardly an economic model and hardly tells you about all the in elements, but what was I trying to do here is to remind you there are several things that have to go right for this, for this process to work. Now, it's, it's more complicated than that because actually, uh, as I said before, Every kind of business is constantly being hit by different kinds of shocks. So I've talked about world, techno you know, world shocks, technology shocks, oil shocks, business cycle shocks, financial market crises, and so on. And so every kind of business, whether you're a mouse or a gazelle or an elephant, has to, has to change. So that's, again, the other challenge is just because you were one of the, the successful businesses in the past doesn't mean you're going to do well. So in the United States, at least, you know, we struggled with this, clearly, right, in, in recent times. 
So once upon a time, General Motors, you know, was, was a gazelle. It was a small business. It was a long time ago, but back at the turn of the 20th century. It grew very <coughs> rapidly. It clearly became an elephant. It, it was very profitable, very productive, and very large. It discovered it, it, it couldn't quite compete um, uh, starting in the 1970s, 80s, and so on. It's had to reinvent itself. Okay? It looks like maybe they have reinvented themselves. But, that, but the message is, I'm not trying to pick on General Motors or any, you might have an example of, of, of big companies here in, in Georgia. Just because you were successful in the past doesn't mean that, that you're done. Okay, that's, sort of, that, that, that's sort of the challenge of, uh, of, of what we see in the data. Now, hope, so I've given you two kinds of messages. Message one is you need a relationship between size and productivity. Second, you're going to have to have flexible uh, labor markets, but you're also going to have to have you know, well-developed product markets, financial markets, and so on for this to all work. And, and it's not hard if you think about even that little sim silly picture of all the things that can go wrong. Okay, so when we look around the world, we see the, in some economies it's, it's both hard to enter and hard to exit. We see, as I've already talked about, that, that product, capital, and labor markets don't work very well in some economies. As part of this is good institutions, good, good legal institutions. This is only going to work if indeed the laws and the courts are, are, are well set up to be able to deal with all the kind of complicated issues that inherently are associated both with both businesses and for that matter for workers and consumers. <coughs> this is also only going to work if, if indeed there's good infrastructure. Okay, and, and I sort of say, I've emphasized here public infrastructure in terms of communication edu and communication, but since I'm at a university, obviously, another part of infrastructure is the educational infrastructure. So all these things are going to need to be in place. What One problem I've, I've kind of hinted at, which is one problem the economies clearly struggle with is, uh, uh, I'll, I'll say either explicit graft or corruption, or something that, you know, I'll say is not illegal per, per se, but again, is, fav uh, is favored practices to some businesses. They are large not because they are productive and profitable, they're large because they got, they got favorable treatment. That's hardly a recipe for successful in the economy. Back again to my first message, most workers are going to end up working for large businesses. If those large businesses aren't very productive or profitable, nobody's going to be doing very well. The businesses aren't going to be doing very well. The workers aren't going to be doing very well. All right. So, uh, so the other one. And then, I think one of the biggest challenges is, uh, it, it is, is um, there are many policies that are that are often instituted to can I say often to protect workers and, and well-intentioned uh, policies where you say, well, look, we we need to pro make sure these workers. Um, aren't subject to, to, to these kinds of fluctuations. But, but now I'll go back to my, my first message thing today. Unfortunately, I shouldn't say maybe unfortunately, the very nature of uh, market economies is some businesses are good at doing what they're doing and others are not so good. And the government can't figure this out in advance. The government's not very good. The market has to figure this out. And if that's the case, we need to have a system where you're moving resources away from the less productive to the more uh, to, to, to the more productive. Now, I, I understand. I, if, if I was listening to this talk, I'd say, you've made it sound too simple. It's much more complicated than this. And I would say, I agree completely. This is going to be the sort of last part of my, my, uh, my, my talk. So, so hopefully you, you, you see that you've got to have this kind of flexibility to move resources away from less productive to more productive businesses. But, but that means workers have to, be, have to move from business to business. And oftentimes what this means, can I say, I shouldn't say even in the United States, but almost in all economies, is unemployment. So unemployment plays a role. Now, what you hope is that, is that unemployment has the following features. One is that lots of workers move immediately from a declining business to uh, an expanding business without any unemployment. That's what, what it, the labor economists would call a job-to-job -job flow. That's what you hope from. But, but if, if you don't get that, what you hope is that workers only spend short periods of time in unemployment. And can I say, countries differ a lot in the extent to which that's the case. Historically, at least, um, the US was I'll call it a high inflow and a high outflow economy. So I'm, look, I'm measuring both the inflow rate into unemployment, but also the outflow rate. If, if you've got an economy that has high durations of unemployment, 
you're going to be in the lower left corner. So can I say in this particular picture, Italy is an economy which has, doesn't have that, that high an inflow rate, but has a very low outflow rate. So it turns out it, the Italian unemployment rate's high not because so many people lose jobs, but if you become unemployed in Italy, you can't get out. And, and, and actually what often happens is who can't get out is the new entrants to live workers, the young workers. So, you, so they, they just can't get jobs. Why aren't they getting jobs? Well, do I fully understand why? The answer is no. But under the perspective that I'm telling you here, why, and I'm going to say, why, why, why can the Italian one, young workers not get jobs? Because there aren't the appropriate institutions and market structure for, biz, for new businesses and businesses to want to create jobs. It's as basic as that. It's not an economy that's conducive for job creation. You know, where do job, where do workers, how do workers leave unemployment? Somebody has to hire them. All right. It's as basic as that. All right, so I'm going to bring this to a close. Uh, I think I've, I've essentially said uh, uh, the, the, the primary messages. Uh, a, a critical feature for an economy is an ability to move resources from the least productive businesses to the more productive businesses. I think the evidence for that's now overwhelming. Exactly how to get there, it's not so clear. One way to get there from here, that is one way to achieve that, and I'm not going to say it's the only model, is, is, uh, is the kind of business, uh, the, the model of flexibility and dynamism the United States has exhibited, with a high pace of creation and a high pace of destruction, with a high pace of inflow into unemployment and a high pace of outflow from unemployment. But can I say, uh, so, so, so let, me, let me close with the following remarks. I've kind of talked about the U.S. as though everything's working so well, but I, you know, the, some of the slides that I kind of didn't go over, and it was not because I didn't want to talk about the problem. Is have things been working so well along these lines in the United States since 2007? The answer is no. Durations of unemployment are, are way up. So the creative destruction process in the United States is not working uh, so well um, right now. Uh, and you could say, interestingly, or from an economist's perspective, or depressingly, what happened in the recession is we saw a big burst of destruction. And, and, maybe, and you might say, well, some of that was inevitable because these were businesses that weren't doing very well. But, but since the quote-unquote recovery, we haven't seen the creation that you should, you should see. So, so you're, can I say you're, you're in enormous trouble in the economy as well if you start this creative destruction process and you get the destruction part right, but nobody creates jobs. And so, so why is anybody creating jobs in the United States right now? The answer is I don't fully know. Uh, we could talk about that if we'd like to talk about um, uh, for, for questions. Um, uh, ho hopefully, again, you, you kind of got the, the again the message that, that you need uh, uh, flexibility. And then, then I, I really will leave with the, with the following last thought: it, it, It's inevitable that policymakers want to provide some sort of safety net, and and I'm going to say that actually almost every economy provides some sort of safety net. The critical message from today's talk is it, it shouldn't be a safety net that deters businesses from contracting or expanding. Okay, and that's oftentimes the way they, they take form. If you have high rates of severance pay, that's going to make it so businesses can't contract, and that's going to also mean that businesses aren't going to want to expand. Because if they expand, they, they're going to be subject to the severance pay. All right. Now, uh, what's exactly the right mechanism? Well, I don't think we know. I mean, various countries try different kinds of things. Some countries, like the United States, have unemployment insurance benefits in various uh, Western European, other uh, countries around the world are experimenting with other kinds of uh, policies. What's often the case, what's often the safety net in economies, and it's not a very good safety net, it's the informal sector. Okay, it's workers working basically for themselves on a subsistence basis. Okay, well, that's not a very good safety net at all, and, and, not, and, I, and, and, I'll, and I'll close with the following thought. If, if indeed lots of workers are working for themselves, I, I did ask before the talk, you know, what fraction of the Georgian labor market might be in some form of self-employment or uh, and particularly informal self-employment, and I, and I heard a pretty big number. I'm not going to, a pretty big number. That, that's, that's not a good sign, right? Because indeed, uh, let's go back to the model. We, that, that means that they're not working for the most productive businesses, okay? The large fraction of the workers aren't. Why is that not happening? Well, you guys know better than I. So why don't I stop here, and I'm happy to entertain questions. So thank you very much.
should be made for financial firms. This is a hard issue, right? And why, why financial firms? The notion is if they had let certain uh, huge uh, banks or near banks, you know, AIG, fail, this would have not only brought bank down those institutions, but would have made the financial crisis even more. That's the argument that people like Chairman Bernanke and the Secretary of Treasury at the time uh, Henry Paulson and actually the President of the United States made it. Can I say actually was, there was bipartisan support for, for, uh, for, for that view. I, I think you can make a case for that because financial, uh, fi financial um, contractions are different in the sense that we, 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 I think one thing we discovered in the last five years that um, maybe we thought that we'd gotten over the, uh, the, the, the possibility of bank panic. But we've essentially had a bank panic, right, in the last five years. That's, a, that's essentially what happened. We had a world bank panic. And so, so that doesn't take away from the hard issues that, indeed, by doing this, potentially you are supporting un, less productive uh, large businesses, and, and there are some costs, but, but perhaps there are benefits. A harder issue is, in the last five years, the US uh, government also made a decision to support some non-financial. And so who do I have in mind in particular? General Motors and Chrysler. Okay. At the time, I thought that was a terrible idea. Okay. Why? Look at my presentation. Okay. And, and I'll go ahead and use an example. Uh, it was a costly one for nice. In the 1980s, um, there was similar calls for supporting the, the collapsing U.S. steel industry. So there were some very well-known U.S. steel firms called U.S. Steel, Bethlehem Steel, they were the major steel producers in the world. They failed in the early 1990s. And there was calls to support them, but actually they let them go. And the US, can I say, actually recovered very quickly out of that recession. It restructured in a way that's consistent with this uh, presentation. All right. So do I have a crystal ball? Do I think the US has recovered in a, in a slower way because we supported GM and Chrysler? No, actually, I'm not, I don't think I'm, I'm that clever uh, by far. I don't think I'm anywhere near. Um, part, of, part of the reason that people like uh, perhaps Chairman Bernanke and the administration supported both Chrysler and GM is they said, look, the reason GM and Chrysler are in trouble is not because they're, my pictures aren't right for them, they're not because they're not very productive. They got caught up in this financial crisis like the rest of us. They didn't cause the financial crisis. Other mistakes caused this. And so we need to help them for a period of time. I, and I, this, is the in, this is the inevitable problem with policymakers, so this is a great question face in, I'd say, in every economy when there's a crisis. Because when there's a crisis, it's like you say, well, look, the rules, the rules are broken down, so we need to help out. Right? What's the problem oftentimes with the bailouts and the help out? They distort things. How do you intervene in a way that you actually say, yeah, no, there was something special this time? And the problem is, can you say that every time, of course? Yeah, but see, yeah and so, so basically I should say I agree that I think this is a really hard issue. But that was the argument, okay? So I'm giving you the argument as to why you could make a case because it was a financial collapse um, that, that it made sense. So what I don't understand with the US government sometimes is that they have so many examples to learn from and they have a lot of really <laughs> smart economists, right? You don't think that. But I mean, then, then, then there is, they should know the pattern, right? I mean, after, after every destruction like crisis, uh, the market tends to go back to its normal flow. 
But, I mean, they don't want to let you go that way. They just want to bail out. I agree with you completely. Can I say just... I don't understand that. No, I agree with you completely. Let me just quick, quickly, without other things. Can I say the evidence for Japan in the 1990s is that is they, they supported lots of what's called zombie firms, both in financial and non-financial. And, and it led to a, a, a period of very slow growth. And so I think oftentimes those kind of mistakes are made by government. Can I say economies that are going through market reform, like, like some of the economies I talked about, both the, the Eastern European, I don't know enough about Georgia, but I also I know about the Latin American economies. Oftentimes the way it works is as follows. You, you get committed to market reform. So you open up your, your markets to world trade. You reform your labor markets. You reform your credit markets. You do all these things. Oftentimes things turn sour for a while. All right? And destruction goes up before creation. It's, at that point, it's hard for a government not to say, look, maybe we went too far too fast. We, we've got to help out. Okay? And, and, and am I so smart to say oh, that, that that's never a good idea? No. But, but then I'm going to go back to the evidence here today. If you distort things so that, the, that you find that you've propped up businesses that are not productive businesses and you keep sustaining them, you're going to find yourself in an economy with low GDP per capita. That's not about being super smart. It's about, you know, I understand, but I, you know, I guess I respect the, the, the difficulties that somebody sitting there with yeah. with high destruction, lots of layoffs, rapidly rising unemployment faces. Uh, as we saw, uh, most of the time, government uh, governmental intervention uh, prevents resources from. Uh, flowing uh, in positive direction. Uh, how can government uh, play a more productive role and help resources move uh, from the least productive uh, firms to the most productive? Yeah, so, I, so I think. Can it? Yeah, can I, can I say I think it's very much a matter of institutions and infrastructure. On, on, and I, I don't mean just physical infrastructure, I mean educational infrastructure, I'm, I mean the regulatory infrastructure. It's not as though I'm advocating a completely unregulated market. So we could say, if anything we've learned in the last five years, you know, we, we, on the one hand, we want financial markets to be well developed, to be able to support the kind of dynamics, but on the other hand, we, we want to make sure that, that risk is being um, uh, properly uh, sort of monitored. So, so I think the government has an enormous role, kind of, I'll say creating the business climate is what I would say. So, and that means many different things. It means uh, having the appropriate institutions so that, you know, can I say property rights are well respected, that bankruptcy law is, is well in place, that, that actually contraction can occur, and resources when, again, if you think about the message today is one of the problems of market economies, it's a challenge, I think it's an interesting challenge, is that businesses are gonna fail. And that means resources are going, to, are going to need to be reallocated away from those businesses. Uh, you're, going to need it, you're going to need the labor market and the product market and the legal institutions to, to make sure that that, that happens. Okay. So, so, so all, can I say also, I think in terms of uh, competitive uh, uh, policy. Now, again, making sure that in terms of your, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the policies that you have in place, that they don't, uh, provide too much, uh, not too much, any favorable advantage to large mature businesses who, who, who maybe once were productive um, but are no longer, or, or even worse, they, the only reason they became large is because they got favorable uh, treatment in the, in, in the place. So I think it's like it's creating the, the environment for businesses uh, uh, to do well. I also think that the safety net is, is, is another feature. You know, having, having an economy where you don't have any ability for individuals who find themselves who've lost their jobs to, you know, to, to, be, to help them in some fashion is helping them uh, 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 providing severance pay? The answer is no, because that's actually just going to stifle both the structure and creation. So there's lots for government to do. But it's, you, let, let, me, let me, one slide I skipped over uh, quickly. Is it industrial policy? Actually, the answer is no. The evidence is pretty overwhelming against industrial policy. Why? If you try to ask, if you try to predict which are going to be the rapidly growing businesses by sector, that doesn't account for very much. It's very hard for anybody to guess in advance. I'd say the government's in, in, in particularly not in a good position to do this. Can, basically, it's the old argument. Is the government in a position to pick winners? No, the government's typically not in a position to pick winners. Now, having said that, okay, so I hear, I hear one thing that, that's on the table for Georgia is perhaps 
to create a particular, I'll call it a uh, business zone or empowerment zone, to, to potentially allow you know, an environment where uh, lots, of the, lots of the institutional structure would be in place. That's an interesting, you know, has that worked in various places around the country, around the world? Yeah, it looks maybe it helped in China, that indeed, you know, they, they opened up some places where they started to allow markets to work better. So, so our, that's a more active policy than the one I'm talking about, because when I just talk about the business climate, you're like, okay, well, that, that's not a very active uh, policy. Are there active policies? Maybe, maybe, maybe things like empowerment zones or, or, uh, or you know, special trading zones or so on are things that actually can, can work. Do I, I'm not an expert on that, but I, I don't think it's inconsistent inherently with the message of today. You, you, the message of today is take into account the enormous dispersion and productivity across businesses. If you don't do that, you can easily find the government supporting large, unproductive businesses. And if that's the case, your economy is not going to do very well. I have a question. You have just mentioned the trade for regulatory, uh, regulatory from financial markets. And this one's where there are economists that say that the problem was in regulation. It was not popular. Uh, but there is another story that this poster in Chicago School of Economics they say that the main reason of this financial crisis is too much government involvement in the housing market and monetary policy in 2002 and 2005. <laughs> what are you saying? What is it? Yeah, I, I think I'm just going to say yes. Uh, I want to say I actually think every, all of those factors probably contribute. I, I, I'm not sympathetic. You know, so, so if, if, we had, if you were fortunate enough, or you both I were, I was sitting here and Chairman Bernanke were up here because I've seen him give talks like this. Uh, he would say, it was not monetary policy. It was not easy credit. It was, it, you know, that that's not what uh, happened. He, I think he would say that what he would say, and I've heard when I say about I'm not, I'm, I'm not putting words in his mouth. Whatever he would say was, it actually was the, uh, a, a growth in the part of the financial market, I'll call it the shadow banking sector, that they did, they didn't quite realize how much risk uh, was, was taken on by by by, by that group. Um, but but I actually think. And so I'll go back to your question, which I think was very well posed. I, you know, I don't want to call it a perfect storm, but I actually think my guess is, at the end of the day, all of the factors that you talked about contribute. I, I, you know, can I say that you know, one thing about um, uh, academics is we will be debating for at least the next 30 years exactly how to disentangle all the different factors you're talking about we'll, to try to figure out, okay, was it really monetary policy? Was it easy credit? Was it... You know, was it the lack of uh, regulation in the subprime housing market? How important was the housing market itself? Or was it, uh, was it really more the shadow banking sector that, that played a huge role? Uh, my, my, you know, I'm going to say uh, this is not my area of expertise. I'm, not, I'm more, if you can tell, but I'm, 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 I'm more on the real side of the economy than the financial side. But when I both read the evidence and listen to it, it seems like all those factors probably played a role. So, I, so I, that's not much of an answer, but I, I think you articulated several of the factors that are likely important. Yes. Have you somehow measured the productivity of government? <laughs> yes and no. Okay. So, so here's here's where we've come closest. The more resources are moving to. So, so here here's here's where we've done it in China. So one of the things that, that so in that in that analysis I showed you quickly for China in terms of moving resources away from the less productive to the most productive businesses, a large part of that was moving resources away from state-owned enterprises, and so. China, I think, is a is a good example here for whatever is that is that I think their success is 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 they is that they decided okay we are not going to produce industrial goods with state-owned enterprises we're going to allow the private sector uh, to do that and so who who are the fast-growing productive businesses in China it's it's the it's private but and private on many different ways some of them literally Chinese private some of them FDI some of them joint ventures. Now, I'm, I'm going to say one more thing. When I, I visited China and talked about uh, this work in China with various folks who know lots more than I certainly do about China, they would actually say that all of those factors I, I just mentioned are right, but it actually also brought, brought competitive pressure even on the state-owned enterprises. So they're even becoming, you know, they, they kind of know that they, the way they would put it is even their board of directors now ask them not just for the next five-year plan, but ask them what their profits look like. Okay. So anyway, I would sort of say, economies where a large fraction of the 
of the workforce is working for the government for, for parts of activity that it's not clear why the government is trying to provide that good or service. Uh, they don't do very well, right? We don't, we don't, they, those are not economies with high GDP per capita or, or high G, GDP per capita growth. So that's what we know. That's not, this, that's not a statement about exactly what the optimal size of the government is. That's a, hard, that's a much harder question. And then it's related to this other question about what can the government do. You know, there, there are many core, core services that the government needs to provide in order to provide by infrastructure. I don't mean just roads and bridges and communication uh, networks, but education, okay, and regulatory environment and all that. Exactly what that optimal size is, well, can I, we, can I say we're debating that strongly in the United States this year, so, given the election that's occurring. Well, um, can, 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 I, can I say that the, um, that it, can I, again, the evidence, let, let, let's think about this uh, labor market flexibility and this creative destruction uh, kind of process. You've got to move workers away from less productive to more productive businesses. The evidence is overwhelming that the more educated workers handle this much, uh, much better. Who, who, has the, who has the lowest durations of unemployment in the United States, not just in the current crisis, but Historically, it's the well-educated workers. Okay, they're the ones who often have a direct job-to-job -job flow or a short spell of, of unemployment. So, you know, do I think that's necessarily a panacea? No, I think you need lots of other things as well. But uh, having a well-educated workforce so that that, that have problem-solving skills and good general skills that makes it so that these workers can move from, you know, this kind of activity to another kind of activity. So I think it plays a critical role. Is there any evidence that the education and the market labor flexibility is connected in some way? Well, that's a good question. I don't. I, you know, I, I think we're beginning. I, I, I like the question a lot. I don't know. I don't know uh, evidence uh, per se. I do. I do know there's lots of evidence that the I'll call it the um, the ability to absorb uh, uh, the kind of shocks that I'm talking about here are are very closely related to the level of education. Uh, for, at the individual level and at the country level. Exactly, your, your question's a, a good one, exactly about, well, you know, how do we, con you know, uh, again, how do we connect to so almost like the labor market institutions and the educational system? And I, I don't know that I, I know enough to be able to say, say much about that. One more question. Yes, please. Focus on like uh, closed economy, single economy, ah. this creative uh, distraction and same distraction. And uh, I'm just interested in your thoughts, like what you think can happen when other economies are involved and this creative distraction happens and construction that doesn't happen because the productivity has increased in other economies. No, well, actually, I, I didn't mean to create the impression that I was, I was, I was talking about was going. I think a, an increasing source of the creative destruction that's going on is globalization. I mean, that, that the very nature of the kind of model I had in mind, and that there are more productive and less productive businesses, is partly asking the question. You know, and th this is what you would hope business, that entrepreneurs are doing, and also businesses. They're asking themselves, what's the best place in the world, literally, to create value. That's, that's the question the businesses are asking, all right? And so, any, and, and, and can I say, uh, increasingly resources are, just like I talked about the skewed size distribution, they are concentrated in large multinational firms, okay, who are making exactly those kinds of decisions. So creative destruction is partly very much driven by, by globalization. So economies need to recognize that, that you know, whether the, you're the United States or Georgia, China, India, Brazil, go down the list, that uh, again, just because you, you found a path for growth you know, over the last decade, given globalization, you have to a always be asking yourself, are we competitive in world markets? Okay? Is this the place that international businesses uh, want to create value? Do they, you know, does Georgia have some good or service that the that the world wants, right? Because that's if you're going to going to if you're going to have open markets, you're going to need to do that. Otherwise, you're in trouble. All right. So that's true for all of us. I don't think that's a bad thing, right? That's not a bad thing at all. That according to if, if I you know I don't want to be so naive because 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 remember I 
I understand, I was going quickly, I said, I, I had the typical economist statement, there is no free lunch, this is a costly process. But this process of, of moving resources to the most productive businesses, that's the way you raise world GDP. That's the way you raise world GDP per capita, okay, is that you, is you find that, that indeed, actually, there's, you can, you know, can I, you know, maybe this is naively optimistic, I don't think it is, you can create value everywhere. That, and, and what you want is, you want to make sure you're not an economy that world businesses are saying, gee, this is just not a very good place to conduct business. Right? And, and I'd say businesses, economies get in trouble <coughs> when they start becoming less of a good place, or they weren't in a good place in the first place, to conduct business. So, can I, you know, so, so one of the things, uh, just a, a further thought, so I find myself get, you know, giving these kind of talks to, to various kinds of groups, so, so sometimes I'm off talking to uh, private capital groups, like right? private capital, private equity uh, folks, but also venture capital experts. And that's what those guys think about. They think about where do we want to go create value? Okay, that's where we want to put our money. And, and the regulatory responses to that? Any regulatory responses to that? Okay. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. Can't be any like regulations responses to that? Well, you know, this is not kind of your order. So, 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 um, I, I don't know exactly where you're where you're headed. Um, but, but I, I, mean, I, I, I think the message of this, this, this kind of perspective is the last thing you want to do is stifle the process. Okay? But that, that doesn't mean that, one, you don't want some assistance for workers who find themselves dislocated because of, uh, uh, of this process. It also, I mean, a really, can I say, a very hard issue. I think that, that lots of you know, uh, international organizations and, and both national struggle with is, well, wait a second. Suppose the reason our jobs are moving offshore is because there's uh, unfair uh, and, and uh, uh, labor practices in, in certain parts of the world, and so workers are are getting taken uh, great advantage of. Uh, those are those are those are you know those are those are very real and hard issues. Okay, so, you know I I kind of created this picture of let you know let the winners win. Okay, but but it you know. Uh, in an environment where where folks aren't playing fairly, uh, that, that's problematic. So, so do, do I think those are real issues that that you know key organizations, uh, international organizations, and even and national governments need to be constantly confronting? The answer is yeah, I do I do think that's right. That's part of the role of can I say both national governments, but also international organizations is is trying is trying to kind of monitor that and, and regulate to that. That doesn't mean stifling it. Is right? You don't. You know, I think the evidence is again you got to move resources to to, to where uh, they can be produced at the highest value. So, yes. So I think on the metric that you're using there is GDP as the metric for success. And I think her question was more about other measures of success in oh. the country, so like happiness indexes and measures of income. No, I think that that's a fair point. I think that that's a fair point, which is uh, is is this message is very much about GDP per capita and productivity. Um, and uh, uh, can I say lots of organizations around the world, for good reason, are thinking about other sorts of metrics. And so I think that I, you know, so uh, quality of life indices are 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 are, are relevant. Um, I, you know, I, I I am not. There, there's a whole. Some of you might be into this kind of research. Uh, I I don't feel like uh, I am. There is a very interesting research agenda by academics around the world on trying to measure. Uh, happiness, and indeed, the United Nations is sort of pushing uh, governments uh, to think about ways of coming up with alternative metrics. I think that's fascinating work. I, I, I actually happen to believe that, that you know that this is controversial in the academic literature that there's a positive correlation between GDP per capita and the happiness. But but not everybody believes that. There's actually findings that go the other way. And maybe there's people in this room who are experts on that and whatever. I, I, can I say I'm in the audience on that one. I'm not the ones who should who should uh, who should be answering questions about that. So I understand that's a that's a that's a real issue. Yes. Just don't worry, we have it. <laughs> yes. I have a, somewhere around five years ago I read some source that the most productive nation is Czechs are Czechs. Ah. Do you have any observation about the well, productivity growth? No, I, I don't actually have um, uh, a, a, a evidence on this. Can I say, here, here's the, um, so, so, so really hard question is how to compare levels of productivity across countries. And uh, there's 
you know, lots of good organizations, the OECD, the World Bank, uh, that, that work very hard to try to make it so we can, we can make those kind of comparisons. And I, uh, and, and I, and I don't know enough about uh, Czech, but, and I want to just, but I'm going to emphasize the kind of measures I'm using here. One nice thing about the measure I'm using here, it's all within country. So I'm comparing countries, across countries, but a within country measure. So my covariance measure is, in this country are the, are the most predictive businesses, large businesses. I don't need to have statistics to do that that makes it so that the Czech data are exactly comparable to the US data. All I need is data within the Czech Republic to compare Czech firms to each other, all right? And so one of the hardest issues we face, you know, I'm uh, involved with various statistical agencies around the world is, is finding ways so we can compare apples to apples. Uh, uh, and that's, that's a, you know, all of us who do any of, the, who any, do any of this kind of number crunching, we struggle with that. So I don't know the answer, but I know that that's, you know, that these things are often hard to compare um, across countries. Thank you. Sure, thank you.